More than 1.3 million Americans applied for unemployment benefits last week. When you get laid off, and especially from a really great job and career, you're kind of left in limbo. You know, it's kind of, um, you, you're not sure what the next move is going to be. Now imagine being on the verge of homelessness before this pandemic hit, or working hard to transition out of homelessness and get back on your feet. Then the COVID crisis begins. So I finally get my housing voucher after all this time because I had been on the wait list already since 2016, I think. And what a week later, the world shuts down. The pandemic also highlighted the need for more access to health care. I was just trying to make my, my medication stretch, which I did, thank God, but I did my medication. And I, I, went to see the, I only went to the doctor when I had, like, literally had to, like when I was, you know, about to die. In addition to banning large gatherings, bars closed at noon today. Restaurants will have to scale back to 50% capacity starting on Monday. It is a difficult and frustrating situation, but it's hard to really point any fingers because coronavirus um, is, I mean, who, I mean, who do you, you know, what do you do about that? Who do you blame? Now we're hearing directly from some of the people hit the hardest, from a small business owner to a student to someone now left without a job. Their personal stories of the pandemic impact. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. On demand, in-depth perspective. Perspective on stories we bring you in our newscast throughout the day. We're looking into concerns over voting safety during a pandemic and the battle over mail-in voting. A look at how the protests and demonstrations have played out in our city and an examination of what it means to be black in San Antonio. An issue that you have likely felt the effects of, rising property taxes. The roots of Tejano run deep in South Texas. We examine the cultural impact the music has had in San Antonio. All of us have been affected by COVID-19, but it has become increasingly clear that some have been hit harder than others. We've talked about the toll of this pandemic in numbers and percentages. We've seen those long lines at the food bank and looked at unemployment rates. But for this episode of KSAT Explains, we want you to meet some of the people who are dealing with the realities of this crisis. From students forced to learn from home to people who have had to let go of employees and take pay cuts. The first person we'll hear from is someone whose business you've probably seen if you've ever been to Southtown. Jody Bailey Newman spoke to us about how hard COVID-19 has hit the friendly spot and why a business like hers has faced a unique challenge. The friendly spot has been a Southtown fixture for 11 years now. Steve and Jody Newman opened up the ice house in the wake of the 2007 2008 financial crisis. I was working at USAA and um, uh, my husband just could not get a job is ultimately what happens. The friendly spot certainly finding its spot among nearby small businesses. And what's really nice about Southtown neighborhood is the local nature um, of, the, of the businesses. As the pandemic unfolded back in March, the Newmans, like most, weren't prepared for the toll it would take on their business. Even with our great relationships, we still uh, got about 12 hours notice that we were going to have to shut our doors in March. After being closed for more than two months, Governor Greg Abbott allowed bars to open again on May 22nd at 25% indoor capacity. On June 3rd, bars moved to 50% capacity. But then on June 26th, after a surge in coronavirus cases, the governor reduced capacity at restaurants and ordered some to shut down again, this time with hardly any warning. We didn't even get three hours notice. Um, so that was extremely tough on us. Jody calls it a roller coaster. We are a high overhead business. We have perishable inventory. We had to spend uh, uh, thousands of dollars to buy new inventory to reopen. Um, and so now again, we find ourselves sitting on inventory that we're not able to return we're not able to sell. Now she's left grappling with uncertainty. Closing bars made some sense to, to some people, but when we're looking forward to say, 
okay, now what's the plan? Um, there is a lot of frustration in food and beverage because those answers aren't there. She wishes some help would come for certain kinds of businesses like hers because not all have been impacted in the same way. Food and beverage is one of those sectors that we were ordered to close, not allowed to operate. But because we're an owner operated business, um, it's also been it's also been my family um, that has um, not been paid in months. The friendly spot has had to let some employees go. It's a horrific situation. Jody takes some comfort knowing her former employees are receiving extra unemployment benefits, but that's about to expire. I've created a resume and um, if things don't change in the next couple months, I'll be shopping uh, uh, for a job as well. The, the problem is what jobs are out there right now. Despite a rough past few months, Jody says that she is working to make sure the friendly spot is around for a long time. We have a goal that we want to be uh, there at 943 South Alamo on January the 1st, 2021. Even if we never get back to the way of life that we 100% had before, I'm looking forward to being able to enjoy um, some of the things that we haven't had for months. Some people left without jobs have been left without insurance. This pandemic has certainly highlighted the importance of access to health care and health care coverage. But sometimes simply understanding policies and which plans are best for you are challenges in and of themselves. RJ Mark has talked to a local man who has struggled with that and who needs insurance even more than most. Lawrence Richardson spent more than a year without health insurance. He had Medicaid, but says that in late 2018, his doctor told him that he was no longer covered for reasons that he was not even sure of. And trying to figure out how to get insurance again was not easy. It's been like a lot of hell. Lawrence has worked at Home Depot for the past couple of years, but because he's part time, coverage options are limited. And because he has cerebral palsy, he needs full coverage. I have to have certain kind of insurance because all insurance doesn't cover your. Um, your, um, your 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 wheelchair equipment, so you gotta find insurance. You gotta find a company for that, and like it's just a lot. During the year he was uninsured, Lawrence was forced to get creative. I was just trying to make my medication stretch, which I did, thank God. But I did my medication. And I I went to see. The, I only went to the doctor when I had, like literally had to, like when I was you know about to die. He also had to rely more on help from his friends. Like I have in a, a mango chair and an electric chair. And to get that fixed to the company you got it from, you have to have an insurance. And like, so basically I would have to get one of my friends or whoever to come and look at my chair and see what's wrong with it. I have a strong group of friends that, you know, look out for me. So. Lawrence said he tried to get insurance again, but got very frustrated trying to find the right people to talk to. That's when he came into contact with Connectability. That's an organization that helps people with disabilities navigate the medical system. With Connectability's help, Lawrence got coverage through Medicare. He's continued to work at Home Depot through the pandemic with more peace of mind that if something were to happen, he is covered. And not to mention, he says now that he's not spending so much money on medication and doctor's appointments, he's able to be more independent than he would otherwise be. Once you find the right insurance plan, then comes the effort to pay for it. It can be tough to afford, especially for anyone who has lost their job, particularly during this health crisis. We spoke to one man who says both paying for health insurance and recovering from his traumatic brain injury have been made more complicated thanks to COVID-19. It's been four years since Andre Green was hit by a truck during an early morning bike ride in San Marcos. I was hit by a truck and um, the young man knocked me into a ditch. Andre was airlifted to Austin. He spent four weeks in a coma. I was unconscious, not breathing. He eventually woke up and since then has made impressive strides in his recovery, but the accident caused long term damage. There are times I will get lost. I'll get confused and also I have respiratory issues because of the trachea. Before COVID-19 arrived in San Antonio, Andre was working in customer service at the Alamo Dome. I only worked there part time to get back into being around people and, you know, re-engaging. It also helped him pay for his medication and his Medicare plan. When he lost his job because of the pandemic, 
that became a lot harder. I don't have enough, a lot of money because I only get my disability unemployment. And um, so every dime counts. By working with ConnectAbility, Andre was able to get his payments lowered. We did get it lower than usual, but there's still that cost, you know. It's not just the cost of medication and health care coverage that has gotten more complicated for Andre during this pandemic. It puts me at higher risk for COVID-19 because of my respiratory issues. And then if I talk to someone being six feet apart, it's harder for them to understand me. In an effort to be exposed to fewer people, Andre no longer feels comfortable taking the bus to get around. So I walk. No easy task in this Texas summer heat. Besides the physical challenges, Andre feels like his recovery plans have stalled. After my accident, I had a plan for each step that I take. And I was working with the Texas Workforce Commission to try to get gainful employment. Because of the pandemic, all that has been put on hold. It's left him frustrated trying to figure out his next steps, but he's grateful for his community. Much in the same way his friends rallied around him after his 2016 accident, they're now supporting him through this pandemic. I'm really blessed that I've met some great neighbors and friends who drop off food. And he's looking forward to getting back to normal and giving back. I really want to be an advocate for people that suffer with disabilities because I feel like I've been blessed. When the shutdown happened, parents, teachers, and students were forced into a whole different way of learning and teaching. At first, we thought that school closures would only last a week or two, but they never reopened. And schools quickly moved to distance learning without much preparation. A lot of parents were left trying to figure out how to work from home and also juggle their child's education. Some students didn't have access to the Internet. Others didn't have a laptop or a computer. A learning curve that parents, teachers and students are tackling together. 16 year old Savannah Martinez had no clue that the day before spring break began would be the last time she'd see her friends. I wish I would have known this was happening so I could like really enjoy being in that classroom setting. Savannah attends Cast STEM High School. She'll be a junior this fall. She's one of the many kids across San Antonio and Bear County who don't have internet access at home. Fortunately, Cast STEM had already provided her with a Chromebook and a hotspot at the beginning of the school year. But despite having that technology, she had to share the hotspot with her two siblings who were also distance learning. The internet connection wasn't that great. When I was trying to join my online classes, I would get kicked off my server a lot. So for the first week or two, I actually couldn't join any of my regular high school classes. It also took her longer to finish assignments. Internet connection is not the only problem. For some students, it's difficult to learn outside of the classroom. My brother and sister are here and they come and they distract me or I have responsibilities here at home that I have to take care of now. Savannah says it took her some time to adjust. I can't ask the teacher to come help me personally and help me when I'm confused. It was also an adjustment for teachers. In April, we spoke to Emily Countryman, an eighth grade history teacher at Rawlinson Middle School. The kids up at the secondary level were familiar with Google Classroom and um, turning in work there. So I think for the secondary students, it made the transition a little bit easier. Of course, we had a huge learning curve on uh, Zoom and how to screen record some lessons. Not only did Emily have to teach 165 students virtually, but she also had to juggle her second grader and kindergartner. Parents with school aged children also having difficulty planning around their kids school schedule and their own. I'm not going to say it's easy because it's not, you know, with two working parents full time at home. Despite the hurdles, Savannah, who also has an autoimmune disorder, supports distance learning in the fall. Even though I feel like like the regular high school experience that I wanted is kind of being taken away, it's better to be safe than sorry. These are more than just the sounds of a safe place to go after school. These are the sounds of interest being ignited and of mentors making an impact. At Boys and Girls Clubs, we don't do just one thing. We do whatever it takes to meet the needs of every kid who comes through those doors. 
Because whatever it takes is what it takes to build great futures. Great futures start here. San Antonio has always been a popular destination for tourists. In 2017, the economic impact of our city's hospitality industry was more than $15 billion, and it employed more than 140,000 people. But like the restaurant and bar industries, hospitality has been one of the hardest hit during this pandemic. RJ Marquez shows us the fallout. The hotel hospitality, tourism, and leisure industry has been gravely impacted by COVID. Before she became the CEO of San Antonio Visitor Alliance, Sharon Aguillen was the VP of Entertainment at SeaWorld San Antonio. She knows how much the tourism, attraction, and hotel business means to the city. Sadly, these are the times we're living, and I'm um, a champion for the organization and for our members, and to see them go through what they're going through um, it really, it really breaks my heart, it really does. During this pandemic, people are being asked to stay at home and practice physical distance. So it's no surprise that amusement parks and hotels aren't as busy as they once were. It's caused a ripple effect and is hurting business owners, even those that have managed to stay afloat. So they were not able to bring back as many employees. So now you've got more folks without jobs or unemployed. Not everybody realizes that between the city and Bear County and how they thrive off the taxes generated from the hospitality industry and how some of that funding goes back into supporting the arts, supporting um, sports facilities, cultural experiences. Before the pandemic, tourism was thriving in San Antonio and in many other parts of the country, but a recent U.S. Travel Association article pointed to a very grim outlook. They're estimating that the loss to the travel industry is nine times greater than what happened during 9-11. Like everyone in this industry, Sharon has had to make changes and tough decisions to get through this. Unfortunately, we did have to lay off. So we're down to half to just me. And then also in addition to that, I'm also reduced in capacity and with a pay cut as well. When COVID hit, um, all 100% of our membership was impacted. Some of our members have had to lay off all of their staff and it's down to maybe just the business owner and one or two other people that are trying to. Oh, but Sharon is confident the people behind San Antonio's tourism and hospitality industries will bounce back. We're taking a hard look at finances. We're taking a hard look at how do we survive and make it to 2021. And all of our members are doing that as well. Um, hopefully we're all staying in this together and we all get there together to the finish line. And the camaraderie that exists among this group it is very difficult to hear on a daily basis and see on a daily basis how the virus and the loss to their businesses and what, what's that, what that is doing to them. You wish somebody could just snap their fingers and this nightmare would be over, but it is, we're really living it. The pandemic has forced some people to take a huge pay cut or left them without a job altogether. But of course, others were already in that position before COVID-19 hit. And this global health crisis has made their struggle to get back on their feet even tougher. Sherry Burnett was willing to share her story with us. For the last year and a half, she's been homeless. Things were turning around and then came the shutdown. This is a picture of Sherry Burnett at home or the place that she's called home for quite a while. It's kind of a... Uh unconventional. I've been staying in my storage facility, in my storage unit, and it's, although it's illegal to do so, I've been kind of low-key. She's paid for the storage unit through federal assistance. Sherry finally got a housing voucher through the San Antonio Housing Authority, then came COVID-19. So I finally get my housing voucher after all this time because I had been on the wait list already since 2016, I think. 
And what a week later, the world shuts down. I'm like, <laughs> go look for a place to live, and my voucher was expiring. The shutdown meant she couldn't go view any apartments. Transportation was also a problem. All of it an added barrier to the work that she hopes to take up again one day, being an advocate for sex workers looking for a better life. It's a life Sherry knows too well, one she used to have. I want to do, go back to my outreach. I want to get out there with uh, my marginalized group of people and be their voice, see what they need. Her desire to do that work led to some failed relationships, people not approving, she says. Then add in social distancing. I've been alone and, you know, really distant from everybody for a while now. And, I, you know, not, I'm not lonely, but I need company. So I haven't been able to get out there and start meeting people again. And that, that really, it's really horrible. But Sherry got some good news just days after we met her. Working with the nonprofit Sam Ministries, she finally signed her lease and got the keys to her Saha apartment. Her message to others struggling during this pandemic. I think that they should just um, keep their head up high. They need to get out there and find out what services are available. Um, they just need to stay positive. And you gotta do the legwork, you know, you, it just does not come to you. There are things that they will have to do and you gotta do your best to stay on top of it. Since 1990, Youth Q's mission has been to positively impact youth through the power of choral music. They've done this nationally and here in San Antonio through the San Antonio Youth Chorale. Stacey not only helps the youth, but the community too. Now they need your help as they raise their voices to support the San Antonio Food Bank. Youth Q and San Antonio Youth Corral will like your support in reaching their goal of raising $60,000 for the food bank. You can help them right now by visiting my.safoodbank.org slash youthq and make a donation to aid the food bank. One dollar can make up to seven meals. So whether you give a dollar or $100,000, you're changing the lives of those who receive that gift. Show your support now by making a donation at the link on your screen. KSAT Community, in partnership with RBFCU, University Health System, and Energy Transfer. Job losses have hit historic highs across the country since the start of this pandemic. More than 148,000 people in the San Antonio, New Braunfels area were unemployed in May. RJ Marquez spoke to three people whose careers have been turned upside down during this crisis to find out what they're going through. I had the chance to talk to three San Antonio residents about how this pandemic has impacted their employment. Eddie, Fatimata, and Richard all have higher education degrees, and yet they still found themselves in very tough spots. Eddie Ardunia worked in the oil and gas industry for more than a decade. It was really going good, and then when COVID kind of started, we were slowing down, and then a bunch of us got laid off in April, actually April 1st. We had a feeling, but you know, you're always hoping maybe our company wasn't gonna get hit. You feel nervous because you're just so used to having a good job with great benefits, you know, and then all of a sudden it's just, you don't know what tomorrow holds, you know. Fautumata Lari is a military spouse who moved to San Antonio a year ago. She says the toll of this pandemic on her local economy has taken her by surprise. I couldn't imagine that it would be worse like that. I was like, maybe, oh, it's gonna be a lot of flu season, like a flu season and then pass through. But it was, uh, yes, 100 times worse than what I can imagine. When she lost her job, she decided to stay home with her children rather than immediately look for another one. Like everyone else, it was hard because it was like, um, I wasn't prepared for that. But I was thinking about my kid, they are very young, and I was scared to send them to daycare. So when the office closed down, I was like, uh, it was an easy decision to stay home with my kid rather to go and look for a new job. Richard Kristoff is a military veteran who worked in banking for years before he was laid off. He lost his job before the pandemic, but says COVID-19 further complicated things. Where it got hard was when COVID did hit and I've been out of work for about 
seven months now. Uh, it started getting harder to compete uh, with some of the other people that were losing their jobs also. I started getting nervous uh, about seven or eight months into it, thinking that I wasn't gonna be able to find a job. We struggled a little bit uh, during that time. I am now working at uh, Wells Fargo uh, Fraud and Claim uh, Work um, Center. It's not the job I, I really want, but what do you call it for right now? I have to do what I have to do during this time. Like countless others, all three have had to think about what's next. Eddie and Richard are both now pursuing career changes. You're kind of left in limbo. You know, it's kind of, um, you, you're not sure what the next move is going to be. So I was just thinking like, what industry can I go into that I know even during COVID is still hiring? So then I chose to, um, to obtain my CDL. Network security, uh, Cisco security and networking. Those are invaluable certifications in the IT field. But I think it makes me feel more secure that um, a lot of the jobs that are asking for these kind of certification, um, I might be able to get a better type of job than um, what I could hope for without those certifications. They say with the training they've received, the idea of making a better living for themselves and their families is on the horizon. You're so used to one industry and um, no one would have thought, you know, we'd, hit, we'd be hit by COVID or oil prices. So, you know, like I say, you just roll with the punches and you just make it happen. I'm excited to get back to work. I don't want to be on unemployment forever. That's not what I want. Before she was let go, Fadumata was part of a Workforce Alamo Solutions work experience program, working to get her license to sell life insurance. It's something she plans on continuing when she can. I was worry about this because I was trying to build a new career and it was a pause on that. But she says for her family's safety, she's willing to continue waiting. I'm playing the wedding game and uh, when I look at my kid, I'm, I'm now rushing things because I want them to be safe. Fatumata, Eddie and Richard have all been supported while transitioning careers by Workforce Solutions Alamo. Job training has been coming up again and again when it comes to COVID-19 relief plans. In June, San Antonio City Council members passed a nearly $191 million COVID-19 recovery plan. That included $75 million for workforce development. Money was also set aside for housing security, small business support and digital inclusion. Tonight, storms become likely. When severe weather strikes. Breaking into programming for just a few moments, we have multiple severe thunderstorms. KSAT is live on air and on your Weather Authority app. You need to seek shelter, okay? Seek shelter. Use the radar to track the storm's path over your neighborhood. And if you lose power... Just know if you're watching us on TV, you can stream what we're doing right now on the KSAT Weather app. Real meteorologists, real forecasts. We'll get you through this and we'll let you know when the threat has passed. Live on KSAT and on your Weather Authority app. If the COVID-19 shutdowns have left you struggling, ksat.com slash now hiring is the place to start. Whether it's a new job or something to help you now, there are businesses who need you. ksat.com slash now hiring, powered by Broadway Bank. Get local. Download the KSAT TV app on your device. Local news. Hyperlocal original programming. Hey, you see what happens. That's incredible. I know. Get local. Download the KSAT TV app on your device. Well, in San Antonio, over the last few days, we have been dealing with record shattering heat. In fact, on Monday, that's July 13th, 2020, we saw the hottest July temperature ever recorded in San Antonio of 107. So tonight, meteorologist Katie Blake and I are going to give you some tips on how to stay safe during this heat. A big part of summer heat safety is keeping our bodies from getting too overheated. We can watch for days when this is more likely to happen by forecasting the heat index. And while you might have heard us talk about the heat index before, I bet you didn't know that you can calculate it at home. Oh yeah, so let's take a closer look. So when it's hot but humidity is low, our bodies can cool themselves off pretty efficiently. The drier air actually allows the sweat to evaporate without much trouble at all, and that keeps us from getting overheated. Now on the flip side, when it's hot outside and humidity is high, it's much harder for our sweat to evaporate. That limits how efficiently our bodies can stay cool, and this is where something called the heat index comes into play. The heat index is actually just a temperature. It's something called an apparent temperature. 
to be precise. This just means that it's what it feels like to our bodies, and that's also why we sometimes call it the feels like temperature. And before we move on, Here's a cool fact. The wind chill that we use in the cooler months and the cooler seasons of the year, it's also an apparent temperature. But where the wind chill takes wind speed into account, the heat index does not. Rather, it considers relative humidity along with air temperature. So remember when I said you can calculate the heat index at home for yourself? Well, here you go. The heat index is calculated by this equation where the T's you see here stand for the air temperature and R is the relative humidity. So you just plug in the outside air temperature where you see T's and then the relative humidity where you see all the R's and voila, plug it into the calculator and there you go. That would take some time. So thankfully, computers do this for us very quickly, saving us some valuable time when we are coming up with the forecast for the heat index. Noah also came up with a handy chart that lets you see how high the heat index could get in a certain temperature and at a certain humidity. So at an air temperature of 100 degrees and relative humidity of 45%, which is on the lower side, it would feel as hot as 114. Whoa, that's a pretty high number. So what does that number actually mean for us? Well, if the heat index is high enough, it can mean exposure to heat illness. That includes heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Signs of heat exhaustion include cramps, dizziness, and clammy skin, and you may also start to feel like you're going to be sick to your stomach. Heat stroke, on the other hand, is much, much more serious. Heat stroke can lead to death if not treated soon enough. A big sign that heat stroke might not be too far away, actually a lack of sweat, even though it's really, really hot outside. So protect yourself from heat illness during the summer months by staying hydrated and by taking frequent breaks during strenuous outdoor activity. In the summer months in Texas, we know it gets hot because of the sun beating down on us. We have long summers of triple digit heat usually, but it gets particularly dangerous in a vehicle, especially if you happen to leave children or pets in a car and the car is off. Even when it's only 70 degrees outside, in an hour it can get up to 112 degrees Fahrenheit in the vehicle. Crank it up to 80 outside and it could be up to nearly 125 degrees within an hour. And then finally 90 degrees and we get hotter than that in San Antonio, it could be up to 133 degrees just within 60 minutes inside of a car. And again, that's why we say never leave children or pets in a vehicle. Even if the windows are down, it is not a good idea. And this is just one way that we can help keep our community safe during the hot summer months. Another thing to consider when it comes to summer heat safety is something called the UV index. The UV index measures the amount of UV radiation coming at us from the sun. Uh, we can be exposed to UV or ultraviolet radiation in different amounts with higher amounts being potentially harmful to our skin and bodies. And the UV index will vary from low to extreme based on the seasons and by daily weather conditions. So here's a look at the UV index that your KSAP meteorologist will show you when it's necessary. Necessary. The higher the UV index, the shorter the amount of time it takes for skin damage to occur if you don't put on sunscreen. For example, if the UV index is extreme, which is fairly common here in San Antonio in the summer, it would take less than 10 minutes for skin damage to begin to occur if you didn't have sunscreen on. So some easy ways to avoid skin damage if the UV index is elevated. You guessed it, wear sunscreen, especially on skin that can't be covered with clothing. Higher SPF is of course better. Hats are also a good way to protect the delicate skin on your face when the UV index is high. Well, we hope this all was helpful and of course we hope you can stay cool in San Antonio as we continue to deal with summertime heat. The summer of me is a hit. Stop the music. What a workout. Sing along with the Flintstones and Happy Days. The 
night heat. The day isn't over. It would be a very tense situation. Folks, this is live. It's what's happening right now. We heard the shots and ran for cover. She was not allowed to record video or take pictures. More investigations. Crooks to break into a bar, then drive off with a whole ATM. You have no idea how long employees were exposed. More stories affecting you. This will be a major traffic nightmare. Working to bring you more. Night is not over just yet. The night beat. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains and a special thanks to everyone who shared their stories. We'll see you next time.